If you are a new photographer and you are not accessing these eight different settings, then almost certainly you are not getting the best out of your photos that you can. And the first setting that every new photographer should be accessing is something called TV mode. Now on top of your camera, usually on, the, on a dial up there, you will see a TV and that is shutter priority. And we are going to access and use shutter priority when we are trying to freeze motion in our shots. So this is good for sports, sometimes street photography, or um, cars going by. Anytime we've got something that has a bit of movement, this could be our children or kids playing on a playground, we've got a bit of movement and we want to sort of freeze that motion or that image in time without any blurriness. So what we're going to do is we're going to put the camera in that TV mode. That is going to let us make the decision about what shutter speed we're using. And then we're going to let the camera make all the other decisions for us. And when it comes to picking the right shutter speed for whatever you're doing, it's just a matter of making that shutter speed fast enough to freeze that motion. And just as an example, if you're walking around and doing sort of everyday sort of normal photography where things aren't moving very quickly, depending on what lens you're using or how zoomed in you are, somewhere between 1 60th and 1 80th of a second is usually a perfectly acceptable shutter speed. Once people start moving, maybe they're walking, you probably need to be around 1 250th of a second. If you're following sports, you are going to probably need to be at least 1 500th of a second, maybe even 1 800th or 1,000th, 1 1,000th of a second. And all those numbers are is they represent how long your shutter is open when it's capturing the photo. So the shutter at 1 60th of a second, open, close. At 1 250th of a second, open, close. At 1 100th of a second, open, close. It's so quick. And so the shorter time that that shutter is open and exposed to light, the more it captures that precise millisecond moment. So when we've got action, when we've got something moving reasonably quickly, we go into that TV mode and we dial up our shutter priority. We dial up our shutter speed until we get to the point where we have frozen that motion. And you're really only going to know which one works best for any given situation by sort of experimenting with it in that given situation yourself and with the lens and depending on how far zoomed in you are and a number of other factors. But it's definitely something you just experiment with right on the spot. Look on the back of your screen. Once you think you uh, found the motion froze, then that's the shutter speed you run with. Now, the next mode we want to talk about is aperture priority, AV mode. Now, aperture priority is telling the camera that we want to make the decision on how big the opening is in the back of the lens that lets the light into the camera. And this does two things. The wider the opening is, the more light comes in, and the less hard the camera and the sensor need to work to capture that image. That means that you will get usually a cleaner and clearer uh, photo with less sort of grain or grit or sort of a sort of a staticky looking thing. This is um, often called noise. Uh, it's sensor noise. So what we're trying to do is get that open, let as much light as, as we possibly can in, and that will give us sort of the cleanest image. The other thing that we are making a decision about when we're deciding how wide we want that aperture is, is how much of the scene we want to be in focus. The wider that opening is, the less of the scene that's in focus. So if you see these photos that people do portraits where the person is all sharp and clear and in detail and then the background is all blurry and blown out, they are usually opening that aperture wide open and generally using a lens that isn't the kit lens. They're using sort of a more specialized what they call prime lens, which is a lens that can't zoom in and out. And that lens is almost always going to have an aperture of f2 down to f sort of 1.2 or 1.4. And so the wider you open that, that opening, the more blurry the background becomes. Now, one of the confusing things about this is the smaller the number, the bigger the opening. <laughs> so I know that's a confusing thing, but um, don't try and get your head around it. Just know that the smaller you make that number, the bigger the opening, the more light that comes in, and the more blurry the background is. And so really when this comes into play, if we are trying to do a portrait and we're trying to intentionally have the person sort of sharp and in focus and the background sort of blown out and blurry, then we are just going to open that as much as we possibly can. The time where we might want the opposite is sometimes with street photography or 
landscape photography. And in those situations, we often want to stop the aperture down, which is what they call it when you make the opening smaller. And we make the opening smaller by making that F number bigger. So the when we ha are in aperture priority, we will see a number on the screen that we can change. That is called your f-stop. And that number is telling you how big or small the opening is. So if you're shooting landscape, you generally don't want a situation where, you know, the mountains are out of focus and the tree in front of you is in focus. So as a rule, you want to get as much in focus as you possibly can. And we do that by shutting down the f-stop, making that opening smaller, taking it down to sort of f8, f11, somewhere in that range. The other place we might do this is with street photography. When uh, we're trying to capture sort of a person in a sort of interesting situation, and in street photography, there are times where we want to blur out the background, but most of the time we want to capture a person and uh, in the context of the city they're in and what's going on. So F8 is a very common uh, aperture setting for street photography. Now, just to demonstrate how f-stop affects how blurry your background is, Right now we are shooting at 56 millimeters at f1.4. And you can see this is the type of lens you would use for portrait photography when you really want to blow out that background. And now it's the same shot, the same composition, but we're at 56 millimeters and f8. And what that's done is that has made the background come more into focus. And f1.4 is a very popular aperture for portraits when you really want to blow out that background and isolate your subject and get everybody's attention on that focal point of the portrait or the person. And f8 is actually a very popular f-stop number or aperture for street photography where you actually want to get the context of the city around the person and you want to see them and what they're doing and they want to be clear and in focus but you want that environment in focus as well. Now when we're accessing those two modes you might think to yourself well with this for example with shutter priority why wouldn't we just make the shutter as fast as we can get it and then we'll really freeze that motion sort of to the millisecond or why don't we if we want to get everything in focus why don't we just make that aperture aperture as small as we possibly can so that we have everything in focus. Well, the quicker your shutter speed and the smaller your aperture, the bigger the number, the higher the ISO goes in the camera. And what ISO is, is this is a the way that the camera tells you how hard it's going to work to capture that image. And the higher that ISO number, the more sort of grainy and blurry your footage can become. So right now, we're just going to leave the ISO on automatic, but we just need to be aware when we are accessing the shutter priority mode or we are accessing the aperture priority mode, keep an eye on that ISO number. Because if that ISO number gets too high and you start to notice when you're looking at your photos, they're sort of grainy and noisy and they just don't look right, it means that we were trying to freeze that motion maybe and we made that shutter speed really, really quick, but we also started to sacrifice the amount of light that was coming in. What we might have to do is kind of dial that back and accept a little bit more motion blur for a somewhat cleaner image. The same thing when we're sort of doing landscape photography or street photography and we're shutting that uh, aperture down to f8 or f9 or f11. If we're starting to get some sort of grainy and sort of yucky and unclear footage, we might have to open that up a little bit more, go to something like f5.6 uh, or even f4, just to let a bit more light in. We're not worrying about setting that ISO right now. We're sort of happy to leave it on automatic, but we just need to know what that ISO is doing in the context of our aperture and shutter priority modes. Now, the next thing we're gonna talk about, and it's something that really gets overlooked a lot, is depending on what camera you have, it may, might call it picture style, they might call it a film simulation, they might call it picture profile. This is the way that we tell the camera what sort of color look we're going for. And all different brands have a whole bunch of different choices that you can uh, select as far as this goes. And you can get sort of black and white for cool street photography, or you can get really punchy, saturated colors for landscape photography, or you can get some sort of muted, softer, sort of less sharp images for portrait photography. But if we just leave the camera in automatic or the standard picture profile, we're giving up all that control and all kinds of choices that we can make as far as the way the colors go. And this is one of the things that our phones kind of do for us. So we take a picture with our phone and it kind of makes all these decisions and it does the first level of editing before we even see the photo. With our camera, it generally tries to 
remains somewhat true to what we're seeing. And you know you've taken a photo with your phone before and you're like, oh, it looks pretty good. And then you look at the phone and you're like, wow, that looks amazing. It looks even better in the phone than it sort of does in real life. And if that's the look you're going for, you can achieve that in uh, your camera, regardless of which camera brand you've got. You just need to play with the picture profiles. The other side of that is you might want to take pictures and you might want to create sort of a more filmic, moody, cinematic, or vintage look. You can do that with the picture styles and picture profiles as well. So you really just want to go in there, play with those picture styles, play with those picture profiles, do your own research. There'll be some stuff in the manuals telling what each of them is good for. And you can really tweak the way your sort of finished photos look by going in and playing with that sort of picture style, picture profile settings. Now, the other thing we've got to talk about is something called JPEG and RAW. When your camera takes a photo, what it does is it has all this information that comes onto the sensor. And most cameras are set up to save a JPEG image after you've taken the photo. And a JPEG image is a compressed version of what your camera saw. So your sensor saw an image and the amount of information that was part of that image that hit the sensor was huge. It might be 40 or 50 megabytes. Now, just for a matter of practicality, so that the camera can write down a file that you can easily uh, share to social media and sort of save and put in your photo libraries, it will probably be set up to save a JPEG image. And the JPEG image is what is produced after the camera takes that raw information, that sort of 50, 60 megabytes of information, and compresses it down and makes some sort of final decisions about what that image is going to look like. That is the point when the camera also implements things like your white balance setting, your picture profile setting. So it's making a whole bunch of decisions about the finished image that's going to be written to your SD card at that point. Those decisions can't be undone. Once those decisions are made, they're in the file permanently. But if you put your camera into raw mode, it takes all that information that hit the sensor and that the camera saw, and it writes it to a raw file. A raw file isn't easy to share on social media, and you often need a very specific editing program, or any of the high-quality editing programs now can generally edit raw files. It's a bigger file, and to get the most out of it, generally you do have to edit it. Not always, but generally you do. And you will have to bring it into an editor and turn it into a JPEG to share it. So those are the disadvantages of a raw file. But it gives you a lot of flexibility in editing. And what it does allow you to do is if you screwed up one of your settings or you picked a, a picture style or picture profile that really wasn't the best for that situation that you were in at the time, you think, oh, I wish I would have had a different picture style on or, oh, I wish the colors were different or, oh, I wish I would have got my right, uh, white balance right and I didn't get my white balance right. You'll bring that into editing. You'll be able to change all of that still. You have so much information to work with. So as a beginning photographer, I don't like to encourage people to go too far down the raw path. But what I would say is remain aware of it. And for example, if you're going to a wedding or you're um, having a family trip or something that is an absolutely once in a lifetime opportunity, a once in a lifetime experience that you are never going to get the chance to do again, and you absolutely want to sort of uh, document it as best you can, I would suggest set up your camera to shoot JPEG and RAW. This will take both photos. It will take, or it'll take one photo and write to the card two files. The JPEG file, which is easy to share on social media and save and show your friends, and the RAW file, which has all the power of being able to change those colors and white balance and all these things in editing. Once again, the only disadvantage of this is going to take up a huge amount of space. So you probably want to make sure you got some extra SD cards on you. And you might want the ability, if you're on sort of a long trip, to have the ability to take some of those photos off the SD card and get them onto a computer or a hard drive or onto your iPad or something like that. But if you're going to be having a once-in-a-lifetime experience that you're never going to get the chance to do again, then I would definitely be shooting JPEG and RAW. The next thing we need to know about is the exposure meter. Now, the exposure meter is the thing in most cameras. It goes along the bottom of the screen. It'll have a little dot in the middle, and it'll have negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, positive 1, positive 2, positive 3. What that is going to do is that's going to tell us, we, if we got, say we've got our camera in shutter priority or aperture priority mode. 
you go to take a picture and you're looking through it and you go like, ah, the camera is making a decision for what it thinks is the right exposure. It's doing that, you're telling it what the shutter aperture you want to use is, and then it's assessing the scene and making the decision about what the right exposure is. That is how bright or how dark the image is. Sometimes the camera doesn't get this quite right. Sometimes the camera will make a decision that means that the sky is blown out or there's areas that are too dark. And the way to make it help the, the camera make a better decision in line with what you're seeing or what you're expecting is to have a look at that exposure meter and then use what's called exposure compensation. And generally you can either slide along the sort of that little meter, often you can click on it and sort of slide that back and forth. Alternatively, there might be a dial on the top of your camera that's got sort of the negative and the positive numbers depending on the type of camera you've got. It's called exposure compensation. Each camera accesses it a little bit differently, but the point is it allows you to use these automatic modes and when you go to take the picture, if you think that image isn't looking right, it's way too bright or there's some stuff that's like completely blown out and white, or it's just looking too dark and the main subject that you're looking at is just too much in the shadows and you want to brighten that up, you access your exposure compensation and you tell the camera, whatever decision you made as far as uh, exposing this image, I want you to take that and make it a little bit brighter. Or I want you to take that and make a little bit darker. And that's what exposure compensation does. Now the next thing we need to talk about is focal length. And you've probably got a camera that's got a kit lens or a zoom lens on it. And when you're using a zoom lens, you're making a decision of how zoomed in or how zoomed out you want to be. And that number, it might be go from 15 to 45 or 18 to 55, that number on the side of the lens, which is telling you how zoomed in or zoomed out you are, is the focal length. So if you are at 18, your focal length is 18 millimeters. If you're at 55, your focal length is 55 millimeters. And there's a couple different ways we can use this. I think most people just are standing where they're standing. They see something they want to take a picture of and they just zoom it so they get everything in they want. They take the picture and that's it. That is completely the wrong way to use your zoom lens and your focal range. Because you have some options, your options are you've got something you want to take a photo of. You can actually move close to it and zoom out and get a whole bunch of the scene in or to get that subject in, you can move away from it and zoom in. And you are gonna get a completely different image using these two different techniques. And the first thing you need to know about is something called compression. The more zoomed in you are, the bigger the number on that focal length, the more compression you have in a scene. And compression means that all the objects in your whole scene seem closer together. So say I've got an example might be if you've ever seen these photographs where there's somebody uh, standing on a mountain or sort of a wolf and then there's the moon, a full moon in the background and the moon looks huge and then the person's silhouette is on the moon or something like that. Certainly some of these photographs are just completely digital manipulated. But that same result, that same look has, still is achieved and it has been achieved for years before we even had sort of Photoshop. And that's achieved by getting way, way, way back and zooming in. And uh, a lot of those shots historically were taken with lenses that zoomed to 1,000 millimeters, absolutely massive lenses. And it was the only way you could produce this image where that moon was so big in comparison to the person. Effectively, it made the person and the moon seem closer together. And this might be useful if you're in a situation where you want to get a, per a picture of a person and there's some landmark behind them and you're standing right close to them and you're zoomed out and maybe it's a mountain, a famous mountain, maybe it's Mount St. Helens or something like that, and you're standing at them, and then Mount St. Helens looks like super tiny in the background. What you can do is you can back away as far as you can, zoom in as much as you can, get that person in one side of the frame and just set the mountain up uh, sort of on their shoulder off to one side. That actually compresses the image so it makes the mountain look bigger and, and in the image brings the mountain towards you. And this is a super powerful technique. Understanding compression and using compression is, a, is one of the biggest differences I see between new and amateur photographers and professional photographers. Professional photographers use compression all the time. It is a huge part of everything they do understanding when they want to get that compression or when they don't want to get that compression. And when you don't want to get the impression, compression, you get closer to the subject, zoom out, and that pushes the objects in the background further away from them. 
So those are your creative choices. Do you want to bring those objects in the background and make them seem closer and bigger in the scene? Or do you want to push them away so the person seems much bigger than the objects in the background? Now this is going to be a real world example of what compression looks like. So we're just going to use me and I'm sort of in frame up to just above my waist and have a look at the size of the tree behind me and sort of the environment around me. Now we are going to zoom in and we're going to see how compression changes this image even when I maintain myself the same size in the frame. Now all I've done is I've pushed the camera away from me and I've zoomed into 50 millimeters and I've tried to maintain approximately the same framing. Now what you can see is that tree either looks bigger or it looks like it's closer to me, regardless of which one you sort of choose to think of it as. But it is filling up more of the frame and certainly it has a bigger impact or a bigger presence in the view that we've got than it did before when we we're at 16 millimeters. Now move the camera back some more. I've zoomed into 90 millimeters and now you can see how much closer that tree seems like it's getting to me, even though I'm the exact same distance I've been all along to that tree. And you can see how this would be useful if you had a mountain that was off in the background and you wanted that just over my shoulder or you had a sort of a group shot and you wanted that big mountain in the background to seem sort of close. This is how you would use compression. Now we're zoomed into 140 millimeters and you're seeing how much bigger that tree is becoming in relation to me in the frame. You will also notice the background is getting more blurry and this is also a part of the compression. The more zoomed in we are, the more the background does blur. And the only way to overcome that if we want the background to be more in focus is to make our f-stop number bigger, which is making the opening in the lens smaller. Now along with compression, the other thing that happens when you stand back and zoom in is you will by default get a more blurry background. And the zooming in, the telephoto, or the bigger that number in your focal length, the bigger the number that you're using on the lens, the more your background will be blurry. This can be sort of contrary to what we we're just trying to do with compression in the earlier shot. So with compression, we want often want to see what is in the background. And the only way to, to achieve that, because when we get back and zoom in, if we want that item to be clear, we have to take our aperture number and make that number bigger. F8, F9, F10, F11. Keep going until we get that sort of background more clear so you can identify what the subject is, the person or what have you, and you can still make out what the, the item in is in the background. It makes it clear enough. But in a lot of situations, and that's not what you want. You want to get back and zoom in and get that portrait look where you can see the person and they're clear and in focus and the background is totally blown out and blurry. And that is easily achieved by getting back as far as you can and zooming in. The other thing, because of the compression, backing off and zooming in it produces a far more flattering image of a person's face. So the wider the lens, the more their features, the nose and sort of mouth and chin seem bigger in the frame and the further back and smaller the ears seem in the frame. And actually I've got three different camera angles right now. And just to give you an idea, this is a 35 millimeter lens here. This is an 18 millimeter lens here. And this is probably at about 12 or 14 millimeters. So you can look at these three different angles and look at my face and look at how it looks sort of in the shot and look at which one is the most flattering. And as a rule, I'm looking straight at the 35 millimeter now. This should be the most flattering. I'm looking down at the, the 15 millimeter now. This should be the least flattering. And I'm looking at the 18 millimeter now and this should be sort of in the middle somewhere. Uh, but generally, when you're doing portraits, bare minimum, you want to be at this sort of 35 millimeters. And ideally, you probably want to be at 55, 56 millimeters. And often, some of the best photos and the best portraits you've ever seen taken are taken at much longer focal lengths, sort of like 85 or 90 millimeters, even up to 135, 140, 150 millimeters. If you want to get the best results in photo and video with the gear that you can afford or the gear that you already have, that's what I do on this channel. So be sure to subscribe to the channel and don't forget to hit that bell notification.